what we're going to be covering today is why we want to talk about the performance of IO. Obviously, IO is very important for HPC, but it's also a very complicated issue. There are loads of subtleties and complexities to do with IO environments, and it's really important to understand what of these as an application developer you need to have a grasp of and what you can leave up to the system. Later in the presentation, we'll give some guidance on how to identify particularly bad IO behavior. And we give a few demonstrations on how we can resolve some of these issues and what to look for when doing so. Lastly, we present a summary of the linear tools and some information on how those tools can be used for you as application developers to get a grip on IO performance. A quick note about Alinea. We provide some of the most leading edge tools for application developers for HPC. Specifically, we provide the DDT debugger and the Forge development suite, which covers map and performance reports. Some of you may be aware, as of December 2016, Alinea was taken over by ARM. Now, I want to take this opportunity to reassure all of our customers and potential customers that the objective of Alinea is to continue to be a trusted leader in tools for HPC across every platform, regardless of if they are on an ARM platform, an Intel platform, AMD, IBM Power, we will support these as we do already. To reiterate, this means you will have the same team of people working with you. That will not change. However, being part of the wider ARM community gives us a strength to deliver on some of our roadmap points much faster and with more agility. And furthermore, we maintain full commitment to providing this cross-platform support for HPC and will not lock down our tools to the ARM environment. So back to the matter at hand. Well, what is actually driving these IO requirements? Well, applications are defined by their data sets. We're trying to do science here. At every opportunity, we're striving for higher resolution, more particles, finer meshes. We want to get more out of our application. And quite often this means larger, more complex jobs. We might want to couple models. We just want to make things bigger. And this means more data. But the problem is to run bigger jobs, we have failures on systems. We need to protect against this. So you might have checkpoint restarts in your code, make it agile to failures in the system. But the larger the job, the larger the machine, the shorter the mean time between failure. So you need to increase the frequency of your checkpoints, which means you're spending more and more time doing IO just to get the science done in the first place. And we don't want that. And then at the end of the day, we actually want to get the data out of the applications. Now, we might want this in terms of visualizations, we might want this in terms of uh, data analytics and post-processing, but we've got to move data around the cluster, and that's not a good thing. So why is IO so important for performance? Well, it's often claimed that flops are free, but we're heading towards exaflops in terms of compute performance. So what are the actual performance limiters? Now, in my mind, it's all about data movement. That might be in memory transfers, or it might be to disk. So today we'll focus on IO performance, and it's really key. And it's really key because inherently, IO is dependent on shared resources. Unlike a compute node, 
you have to share the bandwidth of a system between everyone else that's running on that system. And anything that you do to take up this resource will have an impact on others. But more than that, you're also sharing the network fabric, even if it's dedicated. So this has wider implications. You might be slowing down someone else's MPI communications, and that's really not good. So with all of this, you need to remember that it is actually very easy to get IO wrong. And there are big costs to pay when that happens, not just on your jobs, but on the jobs of other people. So to introduce this, I just want to cover a few of the key aspects towards the complexity of IO systems. So starting with the hardware, I mean, for starters, there are many different types of file system out there. Most of you will probably be running GPFS or Luster systems, or maybe even just NFS mounts for some smaller clusters. But I mean, new stuff is emerging. You've got sort of Ceph systems and Hadoop file systems that actually pose some really interesting questions about how IO is performed on clusters. On top of that, you've actually got the infrastructure that exposes that resource. We're talking the network. Now, what type of fabric have you got? What is the topology deployed for that? And that's really important to understand because IO choices on these different systems will really depend on what you have available. So another option is does your system have dedicated IO nodes? And then you get to thinking about job placement what's the impact of this? You've got plenty of other considerations from a system perspective that also need to be taken into account. Some of those involve emerging technology that's coming on the market to help improve IO performance. But all of these just add to the complexity of the systems that we're dealing with. Now, as application developers, we can't actually do anything about the hardware that's available. But what we can do is be aware of it and tune our applications to really make the best use of this hardware. What we are in control of is the software side of things. So we really need to understand the applications that we're developing. Inherently, what is the strategy of the IO that is being performed? Is the application predominantly reads? Is it predominantly writes? But more than that, how is it actually accessing the data? And what are the implications of that? So we might be doing direct read and write calls. We might be using um, calls provided by a library, such as MPI-IO. Or we might be using something more hardware informed, such as HDF5 or Adios, or maybe even something really more advanced like scalable checkpoint restart libraries, which actually provide more of an understanding about the underlying architecture and can optimize for you. Equally, there might be some libraries in there that actually do some reorganization for you and save some of the hassle, which at the end of the day is something we'd all like to see. But other than this, you've actually got to think about what the wider impacts of your IO choices are. To perform the IO, there might be some MPI communication. Do you have the data in the right place? Do you need to move it around to get there? Do you have to employ synchronization points to wait on the data being available? All of this just adds to the complexity of the I.O. So another thing to think about is within the parallel environment, how are the different processes actually writing to file? I've outlined here four of the main methods and schemes of writing data in a parallel way to file. Now, there's no right answer 
on what is the best for each individual application. But there are obviously some schemes that are better than others. For example, a one-to-one -one scheme is very likely to be performant for most codes because it will predominantly involve collecting the data and probably distributing it back out to a single node or a single rank. And this is likely to be a real performance bottleneck. Whereas something like an end-to-one -one scheme might be really efficient. You can stride your data across the file. And as long as you don't run into issues with locks, this can be very performant. There are also other ways of doing it um, that might be suitable for your application. And that's something that you need to understand as an application developer. So we've discussed the complexities, but how do you actually know if you have a performance issue? And basically, this all comes down to runtime. Now, what we're looking for is, are there particularly long runtimes? If you get I.O. wrong, it will have a negative impact on application runtime. But more than that, it may be sporadic. Are there periodic slowdowns in your code? Are there times when you think it's actually just hung and you're not sure whether it's your application, it's the node, it's luster, you just don't know. And then are your sysadmins just really unhappy with you? If you're running into that kind of issue, chances are you've probably got a performance issue from your IO. So what we want to establish is a workflow of monitoring and resolving IO performance issues. So I've outlined here the five stages that are key. And I think it's worth mentioning that this is really important that this is a cycle. This is something that you should be doing consistently. And throughout the course of this presentation, I'll be touching on the different topics covered here. But predominantly, we want to be able to observe that we have an IO performance issue, have the tools to investigate that IO issue, find some means to resolve it, validate that the changes we have made have actually fixed the issue in a correct and suitable manner. And lastly, we want to monitor. We don't want this performance issue to reoccur. Now, Alinea tools can help with this. And this presentation should hopefully give you some information about how you can use our tools in your workflow to understand more about your codes and resolve any issues you encounter. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the linear tool sets, we have two main tools that we'll be covering here. We have performance reports, and this is a very high level application health check. It produces a single HTML page analysis of what your application was up to, giving you a rough breakdown of where it spent its time in terms of resource utilization. Now, as part of this, we provide a rough IO breakdown, again, informing you where your code is spending your time. Now, to dig a little bit deeper, we have the Alinea Forge suite. Now, specifically within this, we're focusing on the map product. This is for performance analysis, and it provides an in-depth means of looking at your application over time, finding out what was happening. In this case, we're really interested in what IO was taking place, and hopefully tracking down where our issues were occurring. So starting with performance reports, I've got a demonstration here that just shows the breakdown for a sample application showing you how much time as a percentage is spent either in compute, in MPI, or in IO. Now, the collection of this is incredibly low overhead. We're talking maybe one or two percent of your application runtime, just to give you a really useful breakdown of what your application has been up to. 
and this will just tell you is everything okay this is just a high level health check so this is good to run on a frequent basis and just keep a track of how your performance is showing for each application and that's great if you're changing your code whilst developing it you're employing different uh, problem sizes and you want to understand the implication of that so this is a really useful tool for just seeing where things are and on the left you can see a rough breakdown for io to show where with respect to that 18 percent of our time is it actually going are we spending our times in reads or are we spending our time in writes in this example it's all writes, and we don't have a very good write rate so moving to the map software we can present a far more in-depth analysis of io so here we see the application activity over time now this is a different application and we see here that we have incredibly bad IO performance. We're actually spending 96% of our application runtime in IO routines. Now, that's not good. So this is really useful for just showing you where your application activity takes place. Now, this is the default view within MAP but we can easily switch it to an IO centric view. This provides us a bit more information over time to do with how much data was being read and how much data was being written during the application activity. And that really helps as an application developer to see what issues are occurring and where over the application's runtime. And as we can see with this example, the performance really isn't great. So what we're actually talking about here is an end to one access scheme. We've got multiple instances of the program accessing the same small file on a GPS file system. Now, this is fine in most parallel file systems the files are striped across and we can access them without any issue however as the file we're accessing is actually very small it all resides in the same chunk and to maintain safety on this the file system even a parallel file system such as gpfs needs to lock this file and this has some serious performance implications we saw that we were spending 96% of our runtime in IO. Now, for this example, that actually accounted for spending minutes to write single bytes, and that's just not acceptable. So, what we did was actually spread those accesses out. And as you can see from the uh, map graphs presented, this is really beneficial. For this instance so the amount of time in file io has dropped massively from 96 percent down to 35 percent but more importantly the total runtime has reduced from 1300 seconds to 44 seconds and what we start to see here is the cpu floating point intensity really increasing during the times when we're not performing this IO. So to move on to another example that we have here, we've decided to look at an end-to-end -end scheme. Here, every process within the application writes to their own file. That's perfectly fine. We should have none of the file locking issues that we encountered with the end-to-one scheme previously discussed now what we're actually seeing here is an application that performs three visualization outputs 
this should be highlighted in the orange of the chart. Now, as these visualization dumps are of the same size, we would expect the I.O. portion to be similar throughout the course of the run. Unfortunately, that isn't what we're seeing. So what's wrong? Well, we've got some very poor I.O. write rates, and that's not good. Now, we're actually outputting this file in ASCII format, which really isn't desirable for an HPC application, and that's something we can resolve. And okay, we're using an end-to-end -end scheme. We could probably get some more performance out if we used, say, an end-to-end -end scheme. But hey, on a 32-core job, that's okay. So what is the real problem? So highlighted here at the end of the run is a large MPI section. And what's actually happening is that some of the job, uh, some of the ranks within the job have already finished. And they're sat in a barrier waiting for other ranks to finish. These other ranks are still in their IO routine. And as we've said, this IO section at the end of the job is much larger than the two sections in the middle, suggesting something's not happening correctly here. Now, after a bit of investigation, we found out that what's actually occurring is the rights are taking place. Absolutely fine. But the system is buffering them. And then only when the buffers are full is it actually flushing the buffers out to the file system. So the cost of the I.O. is only actually paid at the end of the execution when all the ranks have finished. Now, for some ranks, this buffer might be incredibly large and take much longer to dump to disk than for other ranks. And this means that the other ranks will have to sit there idle. And this is something that is really bad for performance. So we fixed it. Fine. We moved from an ASCII format to a binary HDF5 format. Now, this has two really useful benefits. Firstly, it's a binary format. So the volume of data that we're outputting is reduced. Secondly, we're moving to an IO library that has an awareness of the Lustre file system and can optimize for the system that we're running on. Now, what's observable here is that the IO portions of the code are now much smaller. We've moved from taking 8% of application runtime to less than 2% of application runtime, and that's really important. But more than that, we can see that the IO time between the three visualization dumps is actually very consistent. And this is really what we were after. As a result, the application runtime has been able to reduce from about 408 seconds to 335, which again is incredibly beneficial. Now, the eagle eyed amongst you can see that there's still some MPI cost being paid during this time highlighted in the blue. Now, OK, there's still some synchronization going on. And yeah, we probably would need to move to an end to M scheme at some point. However, we've made a big difference to this application run. And that's very important. So as I said, this was executed on a Lustre file system. Now, included in the latest version of a linear map we have added Lustre metrics. And these are really useful for telling what is actually happening on the file system. This information covers the write transfer rates to the Lustre file system, as well as some more information about the metadata operations and how many files has been, have been opened during the course of the execution. And for those of you running on Lustre file systems, this information should hopefully provide some 
greater insight into what the application's up to. Lustre is notoriously temperamental, and so having some more information on the metadata performance can actually be very useful to pin down issues. Now, what I want to discuss here is that profiling isn't a static operation. As discussed earlier with the workflow, it's easy to find a problem, to fix a problem, and actually call it a day there. But it's actually really important to understand that not everything is static. Everything evolves over time. Codes change, problem sets change, problem sizes change, but also supercomputers change. We're having new architectures all the time. There might be hardware upgrades, quality of service policies, scheduling policies. So much can impact IO performance. So it's really important that you actually need to stay on track with what is happening with your specific application and keep a track of its IO performance. Now, a suggestion here is to try and integrate some of this performance testing into standard regression testing and actually keep a track of how the IO performance changes over time. And this is a really useful thing to keep an eye over how changes to either the code or to the system have impacted performance. So throughout the course of this presentation, we've covered this idea of a performance optimization workflow and shown how the linear tools can be part of that. We've shown how performance reports can be used as an application health check to identify the fraction of time spent in IO, to understand do you need to go into more detail analyzing your application. For our case, we've looked with a linear map at two instances and identified some issues with specifically write rates, one of them causing issues with MPI synchronization, and been able to show a fix to these problems and validated them with MAP to show that the performance optimization really was gained. Now, this is something that we would love you to try for yourself. So there's free trials available of all the Alinea tool sets. You have to register on the Alinea website and you can download a free trial license that should be good for 64 processors for about a week if you need a renewal to this, that can be discussed with one of our sales team. And this will provide you access to the whole Forge suite, including the DDT debugger and the map performance tool, as well as the performance reports covered earlier. And then what we'd really like you to do is talk to us. We'd like to know what you're trying to do with it and what problems you're facing and how we can help you. And that concludes the end of this presentation. As said, we've allocated about 15 minutes for questions. Hopefully, um, I've seen a few pop through during the course of the, the talk, which have been directed to my colleague, Mark. If anyone does have any more questions, please send them through to him now, and he should be able to pass them on to me and I will do my best to answer where possible. Okay, so one of the questions I've had is about this whole idea. I assume someone's been speaking to the Alinea reps at a booth, I assume at SC, about custom metrics. So this is another feature that's come in or is coming in in the latest 7.0 release. And the idea of a custom metric is to allow advanced users to actually write their own sources of information 
Now, this is exposed through a metrics API. So an application developer can develop a specific library that gathers information about their application and actually plug that directly into the map framework. This allows them to actually gain real insight into what the application has been doing. So one of the demonstrations that we gave at SC16 was writing a custom metric that actually recorded um, information such as iteration count of the application whilst it's running so that the map sampler picks up that information during the course of profiling and then can visualize that through the map GUI that we've been showing throughout the uh, presentation. And that's a really good way for anyone with advanced requirements to actually customize these tools to provide some more information on stuff that's really relevant to them. As I said, this is quite a complicated um, approach to uh, getting data into the um, map toolset and should be considered for advanced users only. But if you do have any questions on that, we are more than happy to discuss your requirements with you. Um, excellent. So I've got a couple of questions that have come through um, since that. And the first one is about sampling interval. So this is actually a bit complicated um, with regards to MAP. So MAP is designed to be incredibly lightweight and scalable. As such, it samples your application. Now, the objective of MAP, unlike a lot of other tools, isn't to sample at a set interval. So the suggestion here was, is it a 10 second interval? No, it isn't. What we actually aim for is a thousand time samples. So we have a sampling frequency that we change as your application is running. This means if you have a application that runs in a minute, we would hope to get a thousand samples. If you have an application that runs in, I don't know, a day, two days, we still want to get that same number of samples because keeping a sample interval of 10 seconds for something that's running in days would just produce far more data than you'd ever want to actually process. So we try and keep it to a thousand time samples. Now, obviously, there are some very clever smarts in the back end to aggregate samples that have been taken over that time and to maintain any salient information that's collected there. What we also do is maintain and merge those samples uh, across the different processes that take place. And so this means, as you'll see through the map GUI, say if you're running on 16 processes, you've got your 1,000 samples in time, you should have 16,000 samples in total. Now, after a lot of work, we're incredibly confident that that provides a sufficient amount of information to analyze your application. So, yes, you're missing quite a few points, but with a thousand samples, if you're not hitting one of those samples, it's unlikely that it's relevant to the performance of your application. Um, if you believe it is, then we're really interested in you challenging us on that and we can work with you to tune the sampling rate and the sampling interval to your needs to get the most out of your application. I hope that answers that question. Now, one of the other questions that we've got in here, in fact, actually, we have two on GPFS 
metrics. Now, that's a really interesting um, question. So GPFS is handled a bit differently to Luster um, with a standard Linux kernel. Um, you actually get a file produced on the uh, block-based operations to a Luster file system. Um, and this allows the linear tools to sample this file and understand what is actually happening on your Luster file system. Unfortunately, there isn't an equivalent for GPFS. So we've done some work um, as part of a research project to actually capture a bit more information for GPFS um, with regards to file operations, to opens, to writes, and we're confident that there is more information there that we can capture and that we can share with our users through the tool. However, for the minute, this is still in the development phase and will not be released as part of the 7.0 release that will include the Luster metrics. Um, again, if you have any specific needs for GPFS, we would love to talk to you and understand those requirements and work to get the correct metrics for how you'd like to be able to analyze your application. So, I hope that answers that. <laughs> the next question I can see on my list is with regards to the regression testing. So, uh, we demonstrated integration with the Jenkins suite at SC16, um, and there should be some literature from us about how we achieved that. Um, but one of the somewhat hidden capabilities of the linear tools is actually to be able to export the data that is contained within them. Both map and performance reports have options to export this information into standard text files, into CSV files, but also some more machine readable files such as JSON output. Now this JSON output is really easily digested by any kind of um, uh, performance monitoring tools that you might have. And this allows you just to collect this information over time and just feed it into your data store and then be able to query it at a later date to actually understand um, what's happening to your application over time. Now, as a developer of performance tools, we have no intentions to make any regression testing suites or anything out there. We merely want to provide the data that is collected about your application and make it accessible to anywhere that you want to store it and any means that you want to post-process that information. Once again, we're more than happy to work with people if they have any specific requirements or interesting projects that they'd like to do surrounding this. Oh, right. Um, okay. Um, I've got a question about the Dynamo Rio um, dynamic binary instrumentation. I have, well, I have to admit, I don't know um, that specifically. Um, but we don't actually perform um, a dynamic binary instrumentation um, in our tools. It's uh, more of a sort of standard sampling strategy of actually uh, performing stack inspection on uh, event counters. So, uh, for example, our information on um, uh, hardware counters can be achieved by querying 
uh, a PAPI library on sampling interval. We don't actually look at the binary to understand uh, the specifics of the instructions that are being queued and executed. Um, this is too costly for the type of tools and information that MAP is trying to provide during profiling. Um, there are lots of other good tools out there um, that do such instrumentation and for those kind of performance investigations where you really need to understand how a line broke down into different instructions and how they were executed, then there are lots of other kind of approaches of achieving that. However, with our tools, we really just want to provide actionable information to users and primarily application developers to understand what is going on within their application. Um, I'm sorry if that didn't answer the, any of the specifics um, to do with uh, the ARM instrumentation library that you're developing. Um, however, I'm <laughs> possibly not the best person to be answering those questions. Um, and I believe that is the last question on my list. So if no one has any pressing matters, I'll take this opportunity to remind people to sign up for a trial on the Alinea website and download your free copy and get testing and see what you get out of it. Um, we'd be really interested to hear your feedback on it, whether it's IO related or performance in general. We love discussing it. So please let us know. Um, and you should have all the required email addresses for the sales and support team. My email address was provided on the cover slide of this presentation, and this will be available on the Alinea website, and the webinar will be uploaded to the internet in due course. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you all for taking part and listening. It's been a great experience, and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Bye.